Legends of the Craft. Myth, legend, and inspirational stories from Freemasonry. Episode, we're talking a little bit about uh, co-masonry. Uh, we're both members of the American Federation of Human Rights. Uh, we are a co-masonic body, and we wanted to help set some of the record straight on uh, some of the myths about who we are and where we came from. Brethren, this is a uh, this is a topic that's uh, very near to our hearts as we're both co-masons, and it seems like co-masonry has a very bad stigma on the Masonic community. You know, how can women be made Freemasons? Nobody really knows. Those that do know only know patches of information. And so we just want to clear up the myths on co-masonry and talk about some of the heroic figures that made co-masonry possible. Uh, obviously, from our perspective, uh, it's very important to have women as Freemasons Absolutely. because uh, it's, it's all the message of Freemasonry, equality, liberty, uh, fraternity hopefully be able to bring this bridge of information uh, to our brethren and other Masonic obediences uh, that we may clear up the darkness on the subject. Absolutely. Um, you know, there is, I think, uh, as opposed to a lot of bad information out there, there's just a, there's a lack of information as to what co-masonry is. Um, you know, many people think uh, women Freemasons are uh, members of the Order of the Eastern Star. And uh, that's just not true. Uh, these organizations are fine. They're great. But uh, we believe women are equal, and they should sit and watch as equals. Uh, we believe that all people, all free people of the world, are able to, to have this knowledge, and, and they have a right to have this knowledge if they come seeking it. So we're members of the uh, Honorable Order of American Co-Masonry. And uh, we're part of the American Federation of Lodges of Co-Masonry. And uh, there are other Co-Masonic orders uh, throughout the world. There's Ladrau Humane, uh, which we did come from, um, but we declared independence from Ladrau Humane in 1994. And that's a whole story within itself. And on probably a later episode, we're going to uh, talk about those heroes because that's definitely something that happened not too long ago and we have a lot of information on. It's an epic battle for independence. Epic. Yeah. It was another revolution. It was another battle for our independence. And so the American Federation, the Honorable Order of American Co-Masonry, should I say, is an order independent of all others. But our roots don't begin uh, in 1994. They begin long ago in 1882. And Brother Brian Bungie has done a little bit of research on the roots of Co-Masonry. And there's a lot of stories of women being made Freemasons prior to this point, but this is the first sort of legitimate um, initiation of a woman, and this is the propagation of co-masonry beginning at this point. So, Brother Bonnie, why don't you tell us a little bit about 1882? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to talk about American co-masonry, uh, we have to go back to France. Now, back in 1882, there was a certain lodge called the Lodge of the Free Thinkers. It was belonging then to a recognized Masonic obedience. Now, they decided to initiate a woman, a certain Marie de Dan. She was a well-known authoress and lecturer, noted for her service to humanitarian and feminist movements. They did so in the presence of a large assembly on January 14, 1882. The right worshipful master, Brother Hugron, justified their experiment as having the welfare and the highest interests of humanity at heart, and as being a perfectly logical application of the principle, a Freemason in a free lodge. The lodge was, of course, suspended for putting the family motto into practice. For some time, Sister Marie de Dam did nothing in the way of extending to others the Masonic privileges she had received. Eventually, she yielded to the persuasion of friends, and notably Dr. Georges Martin. This latter gentleman was a member of the lodge of the Freethinkers when Marie de Dam was initiated. He gave her his staunch support and the benefit of his wide Masonic experience throughout her Masonic career. On March 14, 1893, Marie de Dam initiated a number of ladies in the presence of Dr. Martin, and on April 4th of the same year, Le Drat Humane came into being. 
Now, in 1900, the new Grand Lodge, with a view to extending its ramifications into other countries, found it desirable to work the higher degrees. Aided, therefore, by brethren in possession of the 33rd degree, the body was raised from a craft Grand Lodge to a Supreme Council of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. In doing so, the International Order gained its independence from other Grand Lodges, while at the same time reaffirming its commitment to preserve and maintain Masonic traditions. Now, co-masonry was first introduced in the United States by Louis Wazoo, a French immigrant and coal miner who came to Pennsylvania in 1880 with Antoine Muzzarelli. Uh, today we're going to focus a little bit on uh, Louis Wazoo. Uh, he was an amazing man, and uh, Brother Kumsier has uh, a lot of real good information on Brother Wazoo. Thank you for that history, Brother Bungie. It's real interesting to see that our roots started in France, but now, 1994, we've, uh, we've left the French. Um, but I think a lot of that's based on uh, the differences in the way we approach things. You know, our lodges here today, uh, we follow the English ritual, the emulation ritual, very much dedicated to the work of the great architect of the universe and to perfecting humanity. And uh, our French brethren, while they do very good works in France and throughout the rest of the world, we just had a difference of opinion, you know. For them, um, you can work to the glory of the great architect of the universe or, or to the perfection of humanity. You don't necessarily have to have uh, what seems to be a belief in the great architect of the universe. And this is a difference of opinions. Um, in our opinion here in America, uh, the great architect of the universe is what makes masonry. Without a great architect, there is no masonry. Absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, there's there's a lot of charitable work to be done. Uh, working to the perfection of humanity by itself uh, definitely is a move in the charitable direction. But uh, masonry isn't a charitable organization. We do a lot in the in the way of charity, but that isn't our sole purpose. No, the purpose is to make men better, to to better their minds, to better their souls, to better their relations to other men, uh, to promote family, to promote you know, patriotism towards your country, uh, to promote dedication to your churches. So, co-masonry in America sort of just deviated away, and so that's why in 1994, plus a slew of other small issues that arose, uh, we declared our independence. But America, or co-masonry in America, was first established in 1903. Um, Louis Wazoo, and his wife and a whole bunch of other people received the first three degrees of craft masonry in Pennsylvania. Louis Wazoo was a mining inspector in Charleroi, Pennsylvania. He'd come from Brittany, France. And um, he wrote for a magazine called Les Travelers Union. And um, he was a socialist. Uh, not probably in today's term a socialist, but you know, he, his main concern was the rights of workers, the rights of man, human rights. And so he wrote and gave his time to making uh, working conditions better, uh, expanding women's franchise, and giving more opportunities to people. You know, his socialism wasn't in terms of welfare and all those things that would be argued today in the political scheme, but it was truly the basis of human rights. And, and he did much to advance those human rights in this country. And he found that masonry was a great vehicle to promote these human rights. So he... Uh, again, with his wife and some other people, were all initiated, passed, and raised uh, in a lodge in Charleroi, Pennsylvania. And masonry, or co-masonry, quickly expanded at that point. Um, within 30 years, you would have over 100 lodges throughout the entire country. That's, that's an incredible expansion rate uh, for, for anybody, especially for, uh, for Freemasons. Uh, booms like that, you don't hear that happening anymore. Um, when, when you listen to uh, other programs or you read what's going on in the uh, in the masculine mason world today, uh, it's all about how slow everything has become and how how n nobody wants to join. Everybody's getting older and older. The masons are 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 all dying off, and there's nobody coming in to replace them. But uh, it seems like the the American co masonry uh, we, we haven't had that problem. We've, we had a great boom, and it certainly we're not uh, expanding quite as as quickly anymore. But uh, there hasn't been that that great drop off in membership. No, I mean co masons tend to be younger. They tend to be very spiritual and dedicated to self improvement, very much into the study of uh, esotericism and symbology, 
and and Louis Wazoo started all of this. He, he he is my hero. He is an amazing guy. When I think of co-masonry, I think of Louis Wazoo. This guy dedicated his entire life to co-masonry, and he created something which we're all uh, enjoying the benefits of today. So what happened was is that after he joined, um, he started traveling and bringing co-masonry to a lot of these mining towns. Since he was a mining inspector, he knew a lot of miners. He wrote for a newspaper. He had a lot of contacts. So he established lodges from Pennsylvania to California, from Miami up to Connecticut, Massachusetts. We have lodges in Montana, uh, New Mexico, Colorado. He established lodges everywhere. Um, and many of these places were mining towns because he was able to find uh, these people that were fighting for human rights to not have to work 14-hour days, not to be in mines that collapsed every day. Um, not places where women were just not allowed the same benefits of men. And so in co-masonry, women and men are equal. A woman can be a right worshipful master of a lodge, can be a warden of a lodge. In fact, today, the head of our order is a woman. There are no differences in co-masonry, and, and that's what he spread from 1903 on. What happened was is that he created the foundations of what we will be living in the future because it is in my opinion, and only my opinion, uh, or maybe some share this opinion, but that co-masonry will someday be mainstream, that we're laying the foundations today, what Louis created, of what is to be the future of Freemasonry. Oh, absolutely. It's, if you look at the future of our society, uh, it, it's hard to disagree that equal rights is 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 the mainstream now. It is the mainstream. It, it's it what it's not very shocking that uh, this year there is there is a woman, there is a black man, there are many different representatives of the human race uh, running for president of the United States. And it wasn't I mean some people are 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 kind of stuck on the race or on the sex of these people, but for most people it, it's it's not shocking that there's a woman running for president. It's not shocking that there's a black man running for president. This is accepted. This is the mainstream that we are all equal. Things have gone in that direction, and it's been it's definitely been a struggle. It's been a struggle all over the world, and, and some places are still having a struggle. But in the United States, in America today, it is mainstream that all races and all sexes are equal. And so... Louis hit a bunch of bumps on the way, though. This wasn't all uphill for him. Um, he was arrested. He was suspended. Um, he was rejected in many places. So we want to tell you the story of what Louis did to create co-masonry in the United States of America. So in 1903, he was initiated, passed, and raised, and he quickly got involved. And uh, he started to gain much recognition and support in the Comasonic community, especially that he was one creating a lot of these lodges. So many people had a lot of admiration for him, respect, and they placed their hopes in Louis Wazoo. So Brother Wazoo, and the right worshipful master of Butler, Pennsylvania, including several other members of that lodge, were placed in jail uh, for breaking one of the laws of Pennsylvania, a law stating that no fraternal group or lodge could be formed without the consent of the state. I find this very suspect, Brother Bungie. This, the state obviously shouldn't have any regulation over a fraternal organization. Uh, a fraternal organization has no political power. Uh, it, has no, it has no power over the citizens of that state uh, unless they are voluntary members of that organization. So to have a state regulation over an organization like this, uh, th th that doesn't seem to make any sense at all. But rather than denounce his status in co-masonry uh, and abandon his membership, uh, he sat in jail. And luckily, our brethren were able to raise enough money, around $1,000, which is a lot of money back then, Brother Bungie, were able to uh, give him bail. It's a lot of money, especially for uh, a group of people that primarily was made up of, of women who, who, as a rule, didn't have gainful employment in those days, and uh, in coal miners who definitely didn't make a whole lot of money. That's why they're working 14 hours a day. They did those jobs because it was the only way they could make money. It was a very meager salary and it was miserable work, but they were able to get it together. And they and they released uh, Brother Wazoo, and he, you know, he appeared before the, uh, I believe it was the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, 
and he, you know, he led a fervent defense of co-mastering. And luckily, uh, the judges um, acquitted Louis Wazoo and the other members on all charges. Uh, this was a great obstacle for co-masonry. This really could have shut down uh, the movement of allowing women in a Freemasonry. But um, Louis Wazoo fought. He wasn't going to give up what he believed in, and he went to jail for it. And that's, I mean, he doesn't have the immediate attention of uh, Manson Mandela or you know, Mahatma Gandhi, but he did the same thing they did. He was willing to go to jail for what he believed in. But the problems didn't stop there, and, and the next set of problems are very interesting because they didn't come uh, based upon um, actions uh, of, of non-Masons or masculine Masons. It came from Le Draw Humane. The Supreme Council in Paris of the 33rd degree was almost made up of all French delegates and attempted and succeeded unjustly to suspend his Masonic privileges. The council had grown, you know, very worried of his popularity and wanted to curb the expansion of Comansery under his leadership because the French wanted uh, all of the Comansatic members to to want the French and, and follow the Supreme Council, even though they sort of gave independence to each of the countries to do their own business. But they wanted to meddle in people's affairs, a uh, very European thing, I think. <laughs> and uh, and so what they did is they convened the uh, Grand Inquisitor commanders of the 31st degree. And so on June 3rd, 1907, under the direction of Grand Master George Martin, Louis Wazoo was tried. Um, they declared him in violation of his obligation and elected to suspend his Masonic rights and privileges for a period of three years. And you know, it's interesting, the, the, way, the way they um, justify this is that uh, they were creating the uh, incorporation papers at this time. And so Louis Wazoo in his newspaper printed the incorporation um, information in his newspaper and explaining the creation of the American Federation of Human Rights. And so they said this was a violation of his obligation of giving up Masonic secrets. The Articles of Incorporation are on record at the state. Anybody can pull up anybody those else's... Are, those are public documents. These are public documents, but because he printed the newspaper, he was in violation of his Masonic obligation. This is hogwash. Okay, This is ridiculous. In, in a time where the rituals are being published, where the true Masonic secrets are being revealed all over the place. They're going to cite a brother for for printing something that's that's in the public domain that was made with the knowledge that it would be in the public domain. If any secrets of Freemasonry are exposed within the Articles of Incorporation that are, are known to be put directly into the public view, whoever wrote those papers should be at fault. Not whoever prints those papers, whoever reads those papers. It's whoever made those. Brother Bungie, there's a, there's a letter I have here that he wrote a friend in Seattle, which sort of you know talked about what was co-mastering, what was its purpose. Um, I think you have that over there. You, you want to read that? Uh, Brother Wazoo uh, says in this letter, It is thus, we are striving for the betterment of social conditions, to combat ignorance, poverty, and vice to fight for women's franchise, to extirpate from every land child labor, to care and provide for the widow and the orphan. In a word, to work for the blessings of the family, society, civilization, and good government, to build up human character, to curb human passions by disciplining the mind, to labor for the promotion of men's welfare through the bonds of unity, brotherly love, and solidarity which are the bases upon which rests the structure of our grand and glorious institution, to teach the perfect equality of the husband and wife, to proclaim that the family must reflect the essential attributes of unity, love, and happiness, and to teach that society can be reformed and the face of the earth renewed only by reforming the family, which is the unit of society. These are some of the arduous tasks of Freemasonry. So why was he suspended? Well, I think he, he didn't talk about the uh, finances enough. It seems that his, his concern is with the welfare of human beings in general and not with the financial welfare of certain human beings. I think a lot of people who are in those high positions, they, not that their intentions were impure, but they had been led down a wrong path and they were concerned with money they were concerned with the i mean i hate to bring out the big it's a conspiracy and it's all about the money everybody loves the money but that seems to be the trend they 
they were concerned with the money. They were concerned with the French being in control of all of the assets. And that wasn't what it wasn't that Louis was was necessarily contrary to that. He just he didn't care. No, he cared about human rights and only about human rights. He cared about people. And that is what masonry is all about, people. It's not about uh, the monies, the buildings, the furniture. It's not about the assets. No, it's about people. Um, Last episode we talked about the uh, the the brothers in La Liberty Cherie. They they had no money. So he was suspended. But what's interesting is that right after this uh, proclamation was uh, mailed out to Wazoo, and before he received it, a general assembly was held in 1907. Uh, since the incorporation of the American Federation had occurred, to name a president, the leader of the Federation. And at a General Assembly meeting in St. Louis, all the lodges who had voted in their lodges and their districts and had sent delegates to this General Assembly, much like a caucus, you know, selecting delegates and sending them to like a, a national convention, they overwhelmingly elected Louis Wazoo as the president, the first president of the American Federation of Human Rights, and, well, as soon as, you know, George Martin and, and the rest of uh, the uh, Supreme Council in Paris heard about this, they convened the 31st degree, the Grand Inquisitor's commanders, and they overturned their suspension of Wuzu. He was now given back all his rights. Pretty interesting how that works out. The people loved Wuzu. The people wanted Louis Wuzu. And uh, everybody knows, even at the highest levels of bureaucracy, you don't want to piss off all of the people. You can piss off some of the people, but you don't want to piss off all of the people. You'll never get anything accomplished that way. No, so they, they revoked it. He was now a mason once again, and uh, Louis Wazoo, um, he sort of chuckled this off. He was like, okay, well, I know where Paris stands now, but he wasn't going to give up the great work of promoting human rights. So he continued his work as president of the American Federation of Human Rights, he continued then, renewed with this election, the campaign of expansion. He carried the Masonic standard of the double-headed eagle to almost every state of this country. And he created higher bodies, um, mark lodges, um, chapters of the Holy Royal Arch of Jerusalem, chapters of the Rose Croix, Areopagai of the 30th degree, consistories, and they even had a grand council not a supreme council, but a grand council of the 33rd degrees. It was it was 20 to 30 years of just flourishing. So he continued his his expansion, and you know it's interesting. This was not a political organization. You know he he was fighting for human rights, but the Masonic lodges were dedicated to the spiritual work of you know educating people, telling them about liberty, explaining what liberty is, freedom, equality, brotherly love, truth and relief, benevolence and charity. Um, humility. All of these virtues were being taught in the Comasonic lodges. But what he encouraged was members of these lodges in their areas to write newspapers, organize civic protests, not in the lodge organize these things, but once you leave the lodge with all these ideals and this inspiration that you've gotten, go, mobilize, rally with your brethren, you know, fight these injustices. And there's no way better to fight injustice than newspapers. You know, educate the people in your community, spread the word of oppression. Absolutely. Just as, as these lodge meetings educated our brethren on on Masonic issues, on things that go back for, for time immemorial, the the basis of human rights, the the basis of equality. These with these foundations you, you can apply it to everything, to everything that's going on in, in your society today. Uh, with, with this basic knowledge, injustice is so easily recognized. Uh, the, these matters that are so complex and, and so intricate that are designed that way to confuse the people, they, they become exposed so much more easily. You can tell when things are in place to help human beings or when things are in place to help certain human beings. And I think a testament to Louis Wazoo, and kind of to divert from the politics here, of, you know, his the American Federation's relationship with uh, the Supreme Council in Paris in 1913, uh, Louis Wazoo was looking for a, a place, a headquarters for this uh, American Federation of Human Rights, looking not not just a building where administration would take place, but a place that all the members and their families could come and relax and enjoy. And a place that that promoted health, 
uh, outdoors activity, uh, you know, the gathering of families. And so it was very interesting. He was uh, on a, a Southern Pacific train going through Denver, Colorado, down to Colorado Springs. And while he was on this train, uh, he was looking out at the scenery, and, and here came Larkspur, Colorado. And he, he fell in love. He jumped off the train. He explored the town. And he purchased 500 acres of land there. Um, and they had a very conservative policy of, of finances. You know, they, they paid everything in cash. They didn't want any debt or liabilities. You know, very conservative. And all the members and all the lodges pitched in, raised some money, and they bought these properties. And they first began by building what we call the small brick house. It's a, a beautiful little uh, sort of colonial house. And from this house, that's where they had their first meetings. And from there, they built these stones and they, they harvested the wood uh, to build the, our headquarters, which still stands today. Um, it is not a glorious, you know, building that you'd find, you know, in the Vatican, but it's it's it is something that our brethren built brick by brick, stone by stone. They built the trusses, they put in the hardwood floors, and you know, they cleared acres of scrub oak, planted potatoes, brought in cattle, uh, had a chicken coop. I mean, they built a small community which was all co-Masonic brethren. Very I think, inspirational. I think it is a glorious building. It's not, it's not a large building, but it definitely is a glorious building. It, and it reminds us that, that masonry isn't about the money. It's not about the finances. It's not about having huge cathedrals everywhere. Uh, there, no doubt these things are very nice, but they're, they're not necessary tools of the mason. You don't have to have these these huge buildings to operate in that's not what it's about it's it's not it's about brethren getting together in spirit and in mind to to better humanity it doesn't matter where you do it it doesn't matter if, if you do it in a field it doesn't matter if you do it in a little brick house these things they they have no effect on the outcome of the meeting the meeting is is about the members the work that's done is about the members and it's about their state of mind and it just goes to show that that even in this humble little building, which is next to a very large, glorious building that, that's been recently erected, this is where it all started. And it, it's very humbling, and it's a very, it's a very staunch reminder that uh, you can get caught up in these material things very easily, but that's not what it's about. No, and, and this was a place they built cottages... And it was a refuge. You know, a lot of these miners had a lot of lung diseases, you know, working in coal mines and various other um, material mines. And so a lot of members uh, moved to Colorado and lived on this land so they could live, you know, because of their health. So this wasn't just, again, an administration building. This was a community for co-Masons, right in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, right in the heart of the United States of America, uh, accessible by train um, from all the orients of the country, from California to New York, etc., etc. And the property is still there today. Um, anybody that's real interested can always come down to Larkspur, Colorado, take a tour of the headquarters. We have beautiful um, trails on 250 acres, which go up to Monkey Face, which is a small mountain right behind the headquarters. We have a guest house for members to stay for conventions three times a year. And you can still see all the old cottages and the, the brick building that was built almost 100 years ago. And uh, it, it's, it's a real kick to see all this stuff and see all the different pieces of regalia and the tools they use, the bores, the hammers. We still have all these sort of antiques, these, these relics that um, our brethren used to build this community. And again, all pioneered by Louis Wazoo. I mean, this guy was a master administrator, a master ritualist, a guy with a vision, you know, something better than himself, greater than himself, something for all the people to aspire to. And again, this is, you know, again, First Lodge, 1903. We're now 1913. He purchased this land. And, and for, you know, you history buffs, the building was uh, completed in uh, 1924. Continuing on with our story here, problems still continued with Paris. They weren't over yet. They had reinstated him. But uh, attempting to control uh, the Comasonic lodges in America, and not only America, should I say, in Belgium and all the other countries that Comasonic spread to, um, the Supreme Council, which is very interesting because the Supreme Council 
nine of the Supreme Council members had to be French. It was, it was in the international constitution. So the French wanted to keep it French, if you know what I'm saying. And so one of their policies they instituted in this international constitution was that all documents, diplomas, charters, were in the French language. That, they believed, the French did, that keeping everything in French would sort of be the string that maintained the unity throughout all the federations. Uh, it would be that unifying factor regardless of you know, nationality, race, or creed, and remind Comasins of their French origin. People here in the United States were a little upset. People spoke English here. They wanted to continue speaking English and reading things in, in English. A lot of them didn't know French. So when they received a diploma after getting the third degree and it was in French and they didn't understand it, well, they were a little upset. And honestly, I can't blame them. So there were a lot of protests. Some lodges refused to meet until they received a charter in the English language. Brother Wazoo didn't agree with this. He, he thought, you know, documents should be in the language of the, of the country that it resides in. This is only natural and logical. And uh, Brother Wazoo, fearing this would lead to a secession from Le Dra Humane, uh, wrote to the Grand Master, who at that time was still George Martin, and wrote, quote, I do not want to be a poor prophet, but I must call your attention to this. As soon as we have 20 lodges here, and that will not be long, they will call for an American Grand Lodge, and then the powers of the Supreme Council in Paris over the Blue Lodges will be in great danger, end quote. Louis Wazoo saw it. He saw this coming back in 1915, 1920. Uh, so he wasn't really a poor prophet. Uh, it sounds like a pretty good prophet. He absolutely, uh, he was a man with a vision. And, and usually these men have great foresight. Uh, he knew it would come down the pike. And he knew that trying to impose this will on people, instead of giving the people the freedom that you profess to, to want to give to all mankind, uh, you know, these things instill a, a great love for the people that give them. The people that promote this. That's why people loved Louis Wazoo. Uh, they didn't have any any disdain for the French. Louis Wazoo was French. Louis Wazoo came from France. It had nothing to do with nationality. They they had they had not, there was nothing wrong with the fact that they came from France. They just they wanted a mutual respect from the people that were still over in France to say that yes, we recognize our origins came from you, but we are not French. We are the American Federation. We speak English here, and, and all that we're asking for is a mutual respect here. We respect your French. We respect the French people. Our leader that we have chosen here in America is a Frenchman who came over here to, to help the American workers, but we are Americans. The Supreme Council eventually relented on this issue, and they allowed things to be in English. Um, but there was a seed, the germs of mistrust, and uncertainty that would persist up until 1994 between the Supreme Council in France and the American Federation. And I guess it was sort of sealed from the beginning that you know things would end up uh, the way they did or they have. But you know when you, when you create these seeds of you know imposition, when you try to force people to be a certain way, even though it's against their nature, it's going to cause problems, and I think the French could have um, alleviated a lot of these issues without this French imposition, but they wanted everybody to be reminded that this was a French organization, and when you're starting to move into other countries and become international, you have to have an international identity, not a national identity. That's not going to work, and um, Louis Wazoo was intelligent enough to see this. And again, he didn't want to sever ties with Paris, you know. So he worked with the lodges in the United States and tried to calm them down, and, and then, you know, slowly uh, use forms of protest and letters, uh, getting signatures to try to change the, the Supreme Council and, and the edicts they had passed. Brother Wazoo um, continued the fight for human rights until 1937, and uh, at that point, he he passed away to the Eternal Grand Lodge and was succeeded by Brother uh, Edith Armour. So, Brother Wazoo, I mean, he, he passed away in, in the 30s, but his work continued on with, with Edith Armour, with basically the American, the spirit of, of American co-masonry stayed with, with Louis Wazoo's vision. Uh, it didn't falter. It didn't go back to, to the original, the intentions of, of the French. 
it uh, we stayed with his vision until uh, later on in 1994 there was the uh, secession from the French uh, things kind of they, they came to a head in 94 the problems never they never stopped throughout that time there, there were a series of of disagreements there were a series of problems in 1994 they finally came to a head and ties were severed and that in itself is is an epic story and a wonderful story we want to tell that to you but uh, we don't want to take up too much more of your time today we'll do that in a later episode Brother Wazoo what can we, what can we say about Brother Wazoo he was the man. That's what he was. He was the man. He was, he was a visionary. He was, he was stalwart in his in his his move towards improvement. He he never gave in. He never gave in to the to the temptations that that, that kind of power can bring to you. And he did it all through not through moving his way through a false aristocracy and 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 connecting all of these all of these. Uh, rich financiers together he he did it through the people he went through and he touched the lives of the working people he touched the lives of the poor miners that were out there and his message was so pure that these people came up and they came to his aid before preparing this episode we me and brother bungy were sort of going through different texts you know the uh, Mackey's encyclopedia the new encyclopedia on freemasonry um, internet resources uh, see what a lot of people had to say about co-masonry. And again, a lot of it's pretty negative. Um, Mackey writes, quote, Let me say one other word. We know there is true coin and counterfeit coin, and I am inclined to think that this co-masonry is a counterfeit and that it is not based on true Freemasonry, end quote. Dr. Mackey, uh, I, I just couldn't disagree with you more. Co-masonry is real. It has the interests of people. And it follows the traditions of Masonic ritual going back for hundreds of years. Again, in, in the United States, we use the emulation ritual. We believe in the great architect of the universe. This is not a counterfeit. It's just women and men joining together. I mean, how can Freemasons, who have been on the edge of enlightenment, the shock troopers of the enlightenment, to, to quote another great podcast, not accept women in this day and time? Everybody accepts women and everything. They can become the president of the United States of America, but they can't be a Freemason. This is not acceptable. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's and, and and I'm of the same opinion with uh, with Dr. Mackey. I've read his encyclopedias. I've read his stuff, and uh, every time he mentions one of the great inspirational stories of Freemasonry, he he wants us to abandon these stories. He wants us to abandon these things. He's one of the people who is motivated by by facts. He is a historian and he's an anthropologist. And this this doesn't get me going. This doesn't make me want to go out and change the world. It doesn't. No, no. It, it, the history of Freemasonry that he wrote very educational, but should really be called the history of debunking Freemasonry because <laughs> every every origin of Freemasonry he debunks. And basically says we came from like 1717, from you know from the maturity out of the stone uh, operative guilds, and that's fine. I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Not everybody has to agree. But when it comes to co-masonry, I just don't agree with the guy. I, I I find it a little insulting, honestly. You don't have to you don't have to remove all of these stories. You don't have to remove these things. You, you can give the facts and say, you know, we probably weren't founded by the Knights Templar. It's a great story, and you know what? A lot of the as in everything with Freemasonry, a lot of the illusions that are made in these in these legends, a lot of the illusions that are made by the Knights Templar, these these things we need to hold on to. We need to tell these stories, even if they're not factually accurate. As long as there's an understanding that, no, this probably isn't factually accurate, you need to know the story. You need to hear the message behind the story. And, you know, Louis was all about the message. He was, and that's why he carried the message, and that's why he was successful. In the words of Jesus Christ, judge a tree by its fruits. And here's somebody that created a hundred lodges or more, spread human rights, worked unceasingly to cut the workday down, to promote women's franchise. And it's not that he just promoted it. He, he accomplished tasks. He helped pass laws. He helped organize people and give them hope and faith. That is a fruit we cannot deny. 
Louis walked the walk. He he did it all, and he accomplished so much in his life with with very modest financial backing, with uh, a very modest background. He he did it all through the message. He accomplished these things through the message, and and that. That supports what we're trying to do here with Legends of the Craft. He he is one of my one of my top five heroes here. He's he's one of the inspirations for this show. The show was all about the message. The the history is important, the facts are important, but not as important as the message. Co Masonry is considered by many to be illegal, that it doesn't have a valid charter or warrant of constitution. You know, stemming back to the Grand Lodge of England. And we're going to tell you right here, no, we don't. We, you know, the dry humane sort of came from the Grand Orient of France. The Grand Orient of France came from the Grand Lodge of England. Um, you know, there's a war between all these groups about who's legitimate and who's not. Frankly, as co-Masons in America, we could care less about these charters of constitution. We could care less about what the Grand Lodge of England says. You know, being a Mason is not a piece of paper. It always has been and it always will be about the betterment of humanity, about making better human beings. It's very interesting because in the exam of a Freemason, the first question you're asked is where were you prepared to be made a Freemason? And the answer to that question is in your heart. And so it's in our heart that we're made Freemasons, not by rules and regulations not by documents and charters, not by general assemblies and supreme councils. We need these things to maintain order, to have a functionality of lodges, but these things don't make Freemasons. And when people say that we're not Masons, that we're clandestine, that we're pseudo-Masonic, no, this is not true. We follow the Masonic principles, and I think in my opinion, we follow them better than a lot of other groups because we don't work every day to have business meetings and to do charity. We're working to inspire the soul, to inspire the mind, to bring people together in unity, as Louis Wazoo said, to improve the family so that society can be improved. And by improving society, we work to the perfection of humanity and ultimately to the glory of the great architect of the universe. And we welcome you to come and we're hiding. We hide nothing. Co-Masonry, we, we hide nothing. We, it, it's open to all Masons. All Freemasons, you are our brothers. You're our brethren, and we invite you to come and, and come to your own conclusions about whether Co-Masonry truly is a Masonic body or not. You know, as, as Co-Masons, uh, our Supreme Council here in the United States, we recognize all other Masonic uh, orders that, that uh, work to the glory of God and to the perfection of humanity. And uh, brethren of the masculine orders are always welcome, uh, with permission of the right worshipful masters of our lodges, to, to visit and to see what we're doing. We recognize you. Uh, I know many Grand Lodges don't recognize us, but you know we recognize you as legitimate brethren. And, and our job here as co-masons is not to get rid of masculine masonry. There's a place for masculine masonry, feminine masonry, co-masonry. You know, this is America. Everybody has a right to their own organizations. The only thing that we request and, and hopefully will obtain is a recognition that we are Freemasons. Of course, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but I can't stress more uh, the importance of everybody recognizing what this is all for. Um, this is not about pointing the finger. This is not about saying, you're a Mason and I'm not, and you are and you're not this. You know, This is all about working together for for Masonic principles, and so let's put down these uh, this mistrust for one another, this this labeling, and let us all work together as a cohesive brotherhood to the glory of God. I do find it kind of amusing, Brother Cumsier. In my research, I I found that while the Grand Lodge of England does not officially recognize women Freemasons, they do officially. Their official statement says that there are women Freemasons. They unofficially recognize bodies that admit women, uh, unofficially, but officially they do not. It seems like a matter of semantics to me, and that 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 seems very contrary to the message of Freemasonry. It's interesting because if you look at our nation, um, 
when we rebelled against England, what were our forefathers? They were traitors in England. They were enemies of the state, punishable by death. Uh, today we celebrate them. Back then, they were enemies of the state. Does that mean that they were wrong what they did? No. They fought for the principles which they thought were correct. And so, again, they didn't have warrants of constitution, pieces of paper authorizing them to rebel against England. No, they did it because it was right. And that's what co-masonry is about, doing the right thing. Another criticism of co-masonry is that it's theosophical in nature, that it, Blavatsky, Annie Besant, Leadbeer, and all these other people were co-masons, and really uh, they used co-masonry for their motives and all this. This is just not true. Annie Besant was the grand commander of the British Federation of Ledra Humane. Uh, Leadbeer was a prominent English Freemason, co-mason. This is true. Annie Besant did spread co-masonry to South Africa and India and Australia and New Zealand um, as she spread theosophy. And so there were many members of the Theosophical Society that were also co-masons. But co-masonry is, is, is Masonic. It, the rituals are based on the English rituals. The connections of, of Theosophy and co-masonry come down to one thing, that there were many Theosophists in co-masonry. But that doesn't mean that co-masonry is Theosophical. It's, it's a, sort of a negative argument. Well, it, there were many, many aristocrats that were in the original Grand Lodge of England. It was full of, of the aristocracy. Does that mean that the Grand Lodge of England promotes nobility only? Does that mean that, that the message has been diluted by these people? Does that mean that today that working class English citizens are not welcome in the Grand Lodge of England? That their ideas are not welcome? Absolutely not. I mean, just because there's a group of people in another group doesn't mean that that group's taken over. I'm not a theosophist. I'm not a theosophist either, and Louis Wazoo was not a theosophist. Uh, some of our grand commanders over the last hundred years have been theosophists, and um, you know that brings you know new perspectives into Freemasonry, and that's what Freemasonry is looking for: perspectives, people's different views on things. And there's nothing wrong with that. That actually is important to have that, and you can't get rid of that fact. But we sort of on the show wanted to, you know, to, to put down Mackey's, you know, assumptions of theosophy and all these other things, which have permeated through the Masonic communities, discussion boards, etc. And, and they're just they're they're just not right. And I also wanted to inform you that if you're taking Mackey's advice to abandon all of these stories, stop. Stop right now. Please stop. Don't 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 listen to that. Don't listen to anybody that tells you to abandon these stories, to abandon the myths, to abandon the legends. Don't eat them up as fact. Don't do that. Don't promote them as fact. And don't try to dig any deeper into the facts. Don't go try to look at the ceiling of Rosalind Chapter Chapel to... Don't go try to look at the ceiling of Rosalind Chapel to decipher the mysteries of life. It's not going to happen. But don't lose the message. Hold on to the stories. Recognize them for what they are and use the messages that they promote. There's there's so much good to be found in these myths. Well, brethren, we don't want to take up any more of your time, so we'll be signing off here uh, until next month. And just want to let you guys know that we will be talking about some of the second-degree myths. Uh, we've spent the last few episodes talking about modern heroes, but let's get into the myth and legend of Freemason. Let's go back in time. Let's go to Israel. I know some of you are itching, you're itching for some Templar stuff. I know you're itching for it, but uh, we're not. We're not. We're, we're kind of full of it for the time being. We are going to talk about the Templars at some point, but since that's all most people like to talk about, we just really want to talk about things yeah, that um, are unique. Go ahead and go Google them if you want to hear about them. You, there is an abundance of material about them. We love them. Love them. Love the Templars. Love what they did. And when we get to the Templars, we're not going to talk about Jack de Molay. We're going to talk about those unique stories that hopefully many of you haven't heard and would like to hear. Maybe about the early creation. Those Grand Masters, which were, there were many, that many don't even know their names or what they accomplished. It, but that's for another show. We'll talk about that later. We're going to go back to Israel. We're going to go back to the biblical times. We're actually going to go back to a biblical story. And yes... 
there will be bloodshed in this story. It is an epic, epic battle that we'll be talking about. I know a lot of you have been just just chomping at the bit, waiting for some, some real juicy myths, some real good, epic stories to come down the pike, and, and they are. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed with next month's podcast. This has been Legend of the Craft. We hope you've been inspired, and we'll tune in next month for more myths and legends of Freemasonry.